would you look at that, another Kirk Hammett signature guitar. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. However, this model is all Kirk Hammett. It is a homegrown signature model that he's used forever. This was Kirk's first Gibson that got him into the brand. It was used on the iconic albums Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning, Master of Puppets, and Justice for All, the Black Album. There is no disputing that this is a very iconic guitar. But if you're not familiar with who Kirk Hammett is, he's a member of the group Metallica. Maybe you've heard of them. They're my number one favorite band of all time. Still hope Open and pray and James Hetfield joins Gibson and we finally get that Iron Cross Les Paul, but until then, we've got this $15,000 recreation of a 1979 Flying V. First thing is the case. We actually have an SKB hard shell case and normally it's like, uh, custom shop, I usually expect the Gibson custom shop case. But the reason they did this is it mimics the actual case that Kirk uses. So Kirk Black Flying V original, that is what was on there. I didn't put this tape on here. Metallica, two of nine. Over here, it actually says museum. They've got another museum up here on the top. Then we have a Metallica museum hang tag down here. Now that's enough with the case. Let's see what we've got going on with the guitar itself. There it is in all of its aged glory. So, all right, first off, let's find out. Does it actually feel like a 70s flying V? Because 70s Vs are amazing. They have this real resonance C. They're constructed just a little bit different. They've got these kind of goofy rounded overhead headstocks. First strum. Not quite as resonant as some 70s Vs that I've had in the past, but you know, every guitar is a little bit different. So I'll be honest, I'm kind of pessimistic on this new release because it just seems so expensive for what this is and the fact that we already had this model reissued in the year 2012 and they had made 150 aged guitars and 50 aged signed versions. And they typically sold on the used market between five and 8,000. Well, at least that's what they used to sell for. Once these things came out, people are now asking 20 grand. Now, whether or not they sell for that is a completely different story. So here we are a little bit over 10 years later, let's see what's changed. So the biggest difference of this release is the fact that they were trying to mimic this guitar at an earlier stage of its life from the 2012 run. That one had EMG pickups in it. It was the 81 in the bridge and the H series in the neck. But this is pre-mod. They actually put T-type pickups in this iteration, which is Gibson's current take on a T-top, which is what would have originally came in a flying V of this era. But they also made 200 of these, but this time they were all aged and they had a signed photo in the case that we'll see here in a second. But besides the aging and the pickups, the most iconic feature about about this flying V is the bridge that we have on here. It's a recreation of the Stars Guitar Engineering Bridge. Kind of has some like Jazz Master like elements to it. It's pretty interesting. But at the same time, these are Murphy Lab creations, so you get all the aging around here. So we'll just take a second to kind of appreciate that. You've got our finish checking, nicks and dings. But perhaps the most iconic thing about this guitar is the tape that he has back here. Whether that's to hide some buckle rash so it doesn't get worse, or so it just rubs up against him or stays put in a nicer way. I like this area where it's actually rubbed straight through the tape back into the wood. And pretty basic aging on our neck. But I like this headstock. They did a fantastic job replicating replaced tuner holes on here. <laughs> that actually looks pretty realistic. I'll give it to him on that one. But then we have it serialized out of 200. This one is Kirk Hammett 120. Don't worry, we'll go more in depth on the workbench as far as the aging goes. But let's check out our cool case candy. So of course you can't be an expensive custom shop recreation nowadays without having one of these. A cool pennant that has just the exact guitar on it with a KH signature embroidered onto it. And our little skull and crossbones guy there. It's not my favorite one we've seen, but it's pretty cool. Wrapped up in here, we have a Kirk Hammett signature pick set. We get another cloth tapestry. Oh, this is actually pretty cool. I thought it was like a t-shirt in everyone else's photos, but it's just an old picture of Kirk Hammett playing the guitar as some of the other motifs. I'm not quite sure what you're supposed to do with that. Maybe pin it to a wall. Speaking of pins, we actually have legitimate ones that you can pin onto something. I wonder if these will be for sale separately at some point in time because they look so nicely packaged that maybe they will offer them at the garage or something. Of course, we get the case key and the Schaller strap lock counterparts, as well as a Gibson custom shop hang tag and pre-packed checklist. But check this thing out. It's like a touring badge. I'm sure it replicates that something around the original guitar. It's just kind of cool to look at. Nice little lanyard. And lastly, I like it when they do this. They do special COAs for these releases. It's not just the regular stuff. It makes them a little bit more special. So that's a nice feature. It feels like the same tape that's on the guitar. It's just yellow and orange this time. Also goes on the sides, but inside here, we get a old picture of Kirk. 
with his actual signature. So instead of the guitar being signed, it's just these photos because it's easier to mail these out to him in Hawaii and he just signs them or something. And then you get to know what number you got over here. And if we're being honest here, the fit of the case is atrocious, but I think it's that way on purpose because this is the recreation of his guitar. And that gives them room to put these cloth materials underneath there for extra padding. And so it fits and they don't have to fold them up. And maybe they were having issues of this stuff actually fitting in the small compartment. So overall, a pretty cool little offering here. I still feel it was priced maybe a little bit too much, but let's not let it taint the rest of this review. Let's just enjoy this guitar for what it is by throwing it onto the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. I noticed something strange on our pennant over here. So take a good look at this guitar, the one that they're selling right now. And now look look at the one that's on the pennant. Huh, that's that, that's the first iteration with the EMG pickups. That's kind of funny that they wouldn't tailor it to the version that they were including this with, but yeah, it's a small minor critique. It's just something I had noticed. So we're actually missing a whole bunch of screws on this and you might not have even noticed it. So first up our pickup rings. We don't actually have any screws securing it to the pick guard. It appears all Hammett did was secure it with the height adjustment springs. So since those go all the way through, you don't necessarily have to have those. I suppose it's important to note that this was an aftermarket modification. 70s Flying Vs don't actually have pickup rings. They're just mounted within the pick guard itself. The reason why guys used to do that is it gets the pickup closer to the string so you get slightly higher output. And because it kind of helps stabilize the pickup because if you put it as high as it could go, it would be pretty unstable. But let's go ahead and see what is under the hood. We've got what they advertised, rhythm calibrated T-top and the lead calibrated T-top. We've got a bridge pickup of 7.6, neck position of 7.12, and 3.68 in the middle. We've got the squared off 70 style routes, so those are all peachy keen here. But as far as wiring, here's what we got going on with it. We've got our ceramic disc capacitors, three-way toggle switch, output jack on the front, ground wire going to our bridge stud there. We don't have the toggle switch ring around our toggle. It's around the output jack, probably to help get some security to it. Usually they crack down here because when you yank on it, it pulls up on the guard and yeah, things break. And also part of his modifications are our black speed knobs. You get two volumes with a master tone. Unfortunately, Star's guitar is no longer in business, so they had to get permission to make a custom bridge like theirs, but it doesn't have the branding on the back. And it's mounted just like an ABR-1 bridge because that's what these things originally came with. It's just an aftermarket modification. And this is nice attention to detail a full weight tailpiece because that's what a 70s V would have. So his must be the original. Kind of an interesting aging job on it. But I really like the way that they had aged this pick guard because the vintage guards are very prone to cracking, especially on the edges. So I like how they replicated it because you got to remember, this is a brand new guitar. They still have to warranty it. They can't just start chipping up your pick guard and just say, hey, it's part of the whole aging relic process. So rather than bending and breaking this, what they've done is they've actually just snipped a little bit out of your pick guard and then slightly bent it. Because if a vintage guard was doing this, you could not press down here. It would end up breaking. Then here they just have like some sort of a random cut with a saw. Another little small cut and the ones we were talking about earlier over here. But on the pick guard, this screw right here is missing and this one over there is missing stock from the factory because that's the way his is. I marked it with tape that way I didn't forget when I was putting it back together. And then over here we have like a little bit of black overspray on the pick guard. I'm not sure if that's intentional or <laughs> just part of the thing. Sometimes it's hard to tell on aged guitars. Let's just take a second to appreciate our aging job here. Honestly, the finish checking doesn't seem like what I've seen on a lot of 70s Flying Vs. I'm sure the custom shop just has their own technique that they use for all of them. And example to example will slightly vary. But there are like key characteristics that all of them will have. But if you're looking for a super aged, it's here if that's your style. But moving on from our mahogany body, we've got the mahogany neck with the rosewood fretboard. The Flying V was one of the few models within the 70s that didn't get the maple neck on their original design. Not until the V2 got introduced that they start doing weird stuff like that and the older bodied ones. 22 medium jumbo style frets, acrylic dot inlays, got a 12 inch fretboard radius with the 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length, 
Headstock pitch somewhere around 13 degrees. And it's hard to get the V to sit flat, but I think it's a four degree neck angle. And of course our neck dimensions, 1.55 inch nut width. That is a characteristic about these 70s flying Vs. Very skinny here as far as the width, because at the 12th, it's only two. But then we get a first fret neck up to 0.86, which then increases to one at the 12th. So relatively skinny here, but they chunk up as they go. So kind of similar to a 65 Melody Maker, if you've ever had one of those. That's part of the magic behind these things. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. You can see how much wider it gets. As far as the overall shape, it stays about the same, just gets a bit chunkier. It does have a little bit of a flatness towards the back of the neck though. Although I really wouldn't say you feel that. Now we've got our headstock. Here's what it looks like with our truss rod cover off. Here's the cover itself. It's got that silver Gibson logo and it's black on the back, multiply. And besides the finish checking and kind of a ugly looking truss rod route, everything's looking okay here. Moving on to the backside, not too much to check out, but we can look at our tape and some of the other aging. They do have another tape line down here. And of course you get all that finish checking and the nicks and dings and edge wear. I'd say they did a pretty good job on the back and exposing the wood in this area. I'm curious what happened here to cause that scratch, but only Kirk could be able to tell us that. And maybe not even he remembers the tale. They really went heavy finish checking on the neck. You do get to feel that a little bit while you play. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I will leave that up to you. But hey, we do have a little volute. A lot of times, late 70s and early 80s, Kalamazoo made flying Vs just have these big honking volutes. So perhaps his was smaller. But as far as the exposed screw holes and the slight chipping of the paint, that actually looks very good. But here's our serial number, KH120. All said and done, not a bad weight, just a hair, literally a hair under seven pounds. So let's go ahead and plug in this passive version of this guitar. Sounds fantastic. Really like that middle position.
Now that we know all about the 2023 new Kirk Hammett Signature Flying V, what are my final thoughts on this thing? It's a great guitar. Once I plugged it in, I got it. It's great. When you have it on a strap, it does the whole resonancy thing that 70s Flying Vs do. This one especially has it in the neck, maybe not as much in the body, but it sounds and plays fantastic. I'm sure I like this version better than the EMGs because I'm not a big fan of active electronics, but when you're doing metallic, you know, it works. But this thing will do Metallica songs, but it also does the whole bluesy stuff at the same time. That's what makes T-Top pickups so great. So having the T-Type inspired ones is fantastic. However, can I really suggest paying 15,000 for this? Nah, I think they shot a little bit too high. I mean, maybe if he would have signed the back of the headstock like he did the first run, or they sourced like real Gibson T-tops from the 70s or something, they, maybe then we could do that. But I think there's a reason why a lot of these are sitting around at dealers. I think the $12,000 price range probably would have been a bit more appropriate, but these are crazy collectible guitars. They don't have to necessarily make sense, but I did think thoroughly enjoy this as an instrument so if you're just looking for a great 70s style flying v and you like kirk hammett yeah you're gonna have a great time with this thing but i hope you enjoyed checking out this new iteration anyways and if you're interested in being the next owner of this one i'll be posting it on my website troglaysguitarshow.com don't forget to like comment and subscribe and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one take care If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.